long as you'll talk to him, amen? Amen? Amen. Let's give the choir another round of applause. They've been working on some stuff, and uh, it's just, it shows. They've really, it was just a blessing to my heart. It, it's, you know, if, if, what is it, if that doesn't start your fire, your wood's wet, amen? And uh, that's such a blessing to be able to, uh, to have a choir team and directors who are willing to put in the time it takes uh, to get the songs down and to work on choreographing between two singers and in the choir accompaniments. And that takes a lot to do. And I just want to thank you guys for putting in the time that it takes to do that for the glory of the Lord. So are you glad to be in God's house? Say amen. 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 So good to be out here real quickly. Miss Denise uh, handed this to me. You are cordially invited to the LFBC Cafe, open every first Sunday of every month, October 1st, November the 5th, December the 3rd, from 9 a.m. to 9.45 in the Fellowship Hall. It is free, no donations or tips required unless it's to the pastor. Oh, I don't say that here. Oh, okay. And it says, God bless and see you Sunday. So this Sunday morning, we have it every first Sunday of each month. The LFBC Cafe starts at 9 o'clock. It's our missions breakfast where we talk about upcoming missions, but you don't have to be part of the missions here at the church to enjoy the breakfast. We want everybody to come out. We have, I, listen, I would put us up against uh, uh, Zippers or anybody else that wants to, against Miss Denise's cooking on Sunday mornings. Amen. It is a blessing. We have pork chops, bacon, eggs, grits, toast, biscuits, jelly, jam, whatever you want. It, it's, it's great. And you know your pastor's there bright and early. Amen. And so please come out and be part of that. Turning your Bibles to the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. We're going we're gonna to look at something um, that's going to be kind of familiar from last week. It's going to be kind of a flip side to last week. And I want to call it the right attitude. The right attitude. I know we've got some families that are that are gone this week. They're out of town. We had quite a few that were out of town during the week and just got back in town yesterday. And we got a, quite a few that are out of town this weekend. So be praying for them. The right attitude. You know, last week we talked about the sons of thunder. Let me cover up my pen. The sons of thunder. This was James and John and their desire to call down fire from God to destroy a non-conforming Samaritan village. We remember that last week. They, they, they would not accept Christ there because he was heading to Jerusalem. And they said, Lord, just let us lay waste to the place. And we're so glad that they didn't because we found out that later that many of them got saved. The Lord rebuked James and John and refused to bring down the fire. He stated he had come to save men, not to destroy them, letting us see that they had the wrong attitude in this particular situation. This morning, I want to minister to us about another kind of fire that came from above. Okay, so we're going to be looking at another kind of fire. But this time, the people had the right attitude. And that's what it's all about, right? James and John had the wrong attitude. They were wanting to lay waste to the place because of the of their negativity on these people because of their not accepting Christ. You remember, we're just the messengers. We're not the message. And so here we're going to see a different kind of fire. If you've made your way to the book of 2 Chronicles, turn to chapter 7. This is a familiar chapter. It will not be in the most familiar verse. I'm going to touch on it. But chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. As you make your way there, if you would please stand in honor of God's holy, precious, and authoritative word. If you're just excited to be here this morning, say amen. amen. If you're awake, say amen. 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 God is good. God is good. All right. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1, 2, and 3. The word of God says this, Now, when Solomon had made an end of praying... The fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord 
because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Verse 3 says, And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord came upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercies endure forever. This morning, I want to look at these three verses and how they show the right attitudes and actions we should have as Christians. What we heard last week with James and John showed the wrong kind of attitudes. Wanted to bring the wrong kind of fire down. This shows the right kind of attitudes and the right kind of fire for the time. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, hallelujah. Father God, I thank you for this choir this morning. I thank you for moving my heart and my soul and bringing me to a place of tears this morning, Father God. I feel your Holy Spirit's presence in here this morning, as I always do. Father God, just show up and show out in this service this morning, not because of what I've done or who I am or the, or the orator or the, or the people, Lord God, but because you love us and because we want to praise you and worship you. Lord God, as we'll see in this sermon this morning, Lord God, that you have to do things the right way. It's not about the building. It's about the praise. It's not about the building. It's about the one who died for us. It's not about the building. It's the cross. Lord God, let us worship you in fullness here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And you may be seated. Just to give a little backdrop real quickly <clears throat> on this particular set of verses, King David so loved the Lord that he wanted to build a temple of great majesty and beauty for all to worship Jehovah God in. So King David, a man after God's own heart, one of the greatest kings of all time, he, he wanted to build a temple to uh, represent his love for God Almighty, for Jehovah God. But God told David that his son Solomon would be the one to build that temple. Now, Solomon decided to build this temple, but he knew that just building the greatest temple did not mean that God would inhabit it. Let me say that again. Solomon understood that just building the most beautiful, glorious, magnificent temple did not mean that God would inhabit it. It would have to be done the right way. <clears throat> People are building bigger and fancier buildings all over the world and God is nowhere to be found in any of them. Many, many places, not all of them, but many, many places, bigger does not mean more spiritual. People are building fancier buildings. I, I like the old saying, <clears throat> or the, the preacher goes through the Vatican and they're showing him all the gold and all the silver and all these things and he says, look, Look at all the, the greatness we have to the little country preacher. He says, silver and gold we have not. But what I do have, I'll give you. Stand up and walk in the name of Jesus. Buildings, Solomon understood, did not mean that God would inhabit it. So Solomon had all the people bring sacrifices, so many that the Bible says they couldn't even be counted. And then he prayed, and that leads us to our first point. I want us to understand this. Solomon had went through all of this. He understood that building this temple did not mean that God would be there. He understood that he wanted to build the greatest temple. He understood that God had told David he couldn't build it, but Solomon would. But that did not guarantee that God would inhabit the temple. That it had to be done right. And so we see that Solomon pray write this down as Christians we must pray we have to pray my wife says this all the time that we have lost the power of prayer we use prayer as an afterthought well if we can't do nothing else we'll pray for them. praying should be the first thing that we do for people 
Praying is our hotline to God, if you will, that we can do in our bed, on our knees, at our supper table, at our breakfast table, at our cubicle, on the floor at work. Wherever you're at, you can pray to God Almighty. You have that ability. You have that right. As Christians, we must pray. Verse 1a states, when Solomon had made an end of praying, in order for him to make an end of praying, he had to have made a beginning of praying. Amen? In order for him to make an end to it, there must have been a beginning. This is referring to his prayer in chapter 6, and you can read that <clears throat> on your own. Here Solomon eloquently prays that no matter how magnificent the temple he built was, it could not compare to the glory of the Lord. He says it don't matter how great, magnificent, beautiful, and sparkly it is, Lord, it doesn't compare to your magnificent beauty. Amen. He showed that he was a humble man with humility. Solomon also made it clear that just because he built the temple did not mean that God would inhabit it. He was an understanding man. He understood with humility and humbleness that this temple was nothing compared to God. This temple had nothing compared to his majesty and that only God could decide whether or not he would inhabit the temple. Solomon knew that if God was going to inhabit the temple, he would need to pray and ask God to do just that. We have to be people of prayer. If you want God to inhabit your life, you have to be a people of prayer. Solomon understood that God was not just going to show up because he built a shiny building, that Solomon had to be a man of prayer. He says when Solomon made an end of praying, that means they had to be a beginning. Solomon understood <clears throat> that if he wanted God to show up, in his house to show up in his life that he had to be a man of prayer. James 5.16 states this, the passionate prayers of a righteous man do much good. King James says the, the fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. We've heard this, we've heard this verse. We know what this verse means. So the passionate prayers of a righteous person, man or woman, do much good. So many Christians today are looking for God to bless their situations, but they haven't even humbled themselves before God and prayed to Him. We have Christians all over the place today who are looking for God to bless them. They're looking for God to, to be this magnificent blessing in their life, to give them all the desires of their heart, and they've not even humbled themselves before a holy God and prayed. They've not even spoken to him. They've not even called on his name. They're wondering why this or that is not happening. If we want God to show up and show out in our lives, we better be praying people. God would have you to pray. God would have you to pray before you date this boy or girl. God would have you to pray before you marry this man or woman. God would have you pray before you take this job or that job. God would have you pray before you build this house or buy that car. God would have you pray before you spend money of your household on something. It's all His. We are to be servants of Him. We are servants of Him. Verse 14 of this same chapter, this is probably the, the most famous verse of this chapter. Many of you know it by heart, but verse 14 of this same chapter lets us know that if we want our land healed, if we want our situations healed, if we want our families healed, if we want our children healed, we better humble ourselves, we better pray, and we better seek God's face in the matter. If we want to see our land healed, if we want to see our situation healed, if we want to see God inhabit our personal lives, we better learn how to pray. Solomon was very specific in saying that the first thing that he did was pray. He says, when he made an end of praying, 
they had set this up to please God and we'll see this as we go along but Solomon knew that prayer was a must we better humble ourselves we better pray and we better seek God's face as Christians as Christian men and women as men and women who come underneath the cross of Christ who have accepted Christ as their personal Savior as Christians we must pray there's power in prayer secondly write this down are you with me say amen you're awake say amen amen all right good stuff good stuff as Christians we must be prepared so first we heard as Christians we must pray as Christians we must be prepared first verse 1b states this that in dramatic fashion I love this in dramatic fashion fire came down from heaven and consumed their burnt offerings and sacrifices hallelujah amen acceptance of God of the sacrifices and offerings so so as he made an end of praying fire came down from heaven the good kind of fire because they were doing things the right way came down and accepted their sacrifice and offerings in chapter 5 verse 6 of this same book we see the sacrifices were so great they could not be counted and you can look that up on your own time it says that the sacrifices that the children of Israel the congregation of Israel brought to the altar to sacrifice for God that he would inhabit the temple that Solomon had built was so great that it could not even be numbered they were priests that would stand around the altar and they would count the sacrifices and offerings as you would bring it and said that the sacrifices were so great they lost count they lost count these people and I want you to I really want you to follow with me the congregation of Israel the ones that Solomon had called to and said we've built this temple we want God to inhabit it we want you to to, to sacrifice unto God they so desired for God to inhabit the temple that they gave everything they had to show God that they were all in do you see that the sacrifices were so many that they couldn't even be counted brother Mike they couldn't even be counted they were so many the people so desired God to inhabit the temple they so desired God to inhabit their life that they gave all that they had. It was that important to them for God to be in the temple for them to worship. It was that important. Let's give it all. Every cow, every donkey, everything we've got, every offering, every sacrifice, put it on the altar because I so desire for God to inhabit the temple. These people so desired God, they were willing to give it all. Most Christians today want to give as little as possible of their hearts. They want to give as little as possible of their time. They want to give as little as possible of their lives, little as possible of their money, and then wonder why God is not showing up and showing out in their lives. They want to give as little as possible with the expectation of great returns. Sounds like a lazy society to me. It sounds like the people that this culture has become, that the world has become. Let me put in as little as I can and get back as much as I can. That's the day and time that we live in, the Wall Street that we live in, the greed that we live in. I want to do as little as possible and get as much gain as possible. So many Christians are running their spiritual lives like that today. It's not about what they can do for God. It's all about what God can do for them and how little they have to put into it. How little time, how little money, how little of my personal life do I have to put in for God to bless me? And we see this all over 
today. The congregation of Israel had no clue whether or not God would even show up. I want you to hear that. The congregation of Israel had no clue whether or not God would even show up, but they weren't taking any chances. Listen. They so desired God to inhabit their lives, so desired God to inhabit their temple, that they gave him all. Why? Because they weren't going to take any chances. They weren't going to take any chances on their spiritual wall. They had no clue or not whether God would even come, whether or not he would even inhabit this temple. But they weren't going to take any chances. They were going to give him all that they had and trust that he would do the right thing. How are we living our lives as Christians? Are we giving God all that we have, not expecting anything in return because he's already given us everything that we will ever need? Or do we give as little as possible, expecting great gain? <clears throat> Romans 12.1 states that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Right? Right? We are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they brought forth sacrifices to please God. Under the New Testament, we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices. You see, they took everything that they had and sacrificed it. They said, here's all of my belongings, all of my possessions I sacrifice it on the altar just in the hope and prayer that God would inhabit the temple they were willing to give it all under the New Testament the Word of God says you are to be living sacrifices they gave all that they had just to be prepared for God. As Christians, we must be prepared as well. They gave everything they had, everything that they owned to be prepared for God. As Christians, we must be prepared as well. Are you prepared to give God all of you today? They gave God all their sacrifices the word of God says you are now to present your bodies as living sacrifices are you willing to give all of you to God not knowing what tomorrow holds not knowing what blessings are coming your way not knowing how much money you'll have in the bank tomorrow or the next day but offer yourself as a living sacrifice give your all to God just because you want and so desire him to inhabit your life they so desired God to inhabit the temple that they gave all to him now because they gave all and prayed The Word of God says, fire from heaven consumed the offering and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Verse 2 states that the manifest presence of God was so great, the priest couldn't even go inside the temple. The Shekinah glory, which means the manifest presence of God. Anytime God shows up like in a cloud or fire, pillow of fire, That's Shekinah glory. That's called the manifest presence of God. The manifest presence of God showed up in this temple, and the priest couldn't even get inside to do their jobs. They're muddling around outside talking about, well, if God ever leave, we'd get in and do our job. How how glorious and wonderful 
to show up to Leonard's Fort Baptist Church and come out to the double doors and the manifest presence of God is so thick, so rich, so deep, you can't even get in the house. Amen. You got to stand outside and say, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I need to get on my hands and knees and pray and sacrifice before I even go in the house. How many of us so desire for God to be like that in our lives. First Corinthians 3.16 states this. I want you to really get this. <clears throat> states this, know you not that you are the temple of the living God? Woo! How to preach, amen? Know you not that you are the temple of the living God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. They so desired for God to inhabit the temple that they gave all. They sacrificed all. You are to present yourself as a living sacrifice. And the Word of God says, you are the temple of the living God. You are the temple of the living God. The Spirit of God dwells in you if you're saved here this morning. What is your desire? Do you so desire for God to show up and show out in your life? You could have the temple of God, the Word of God says, without the manifest presence of God being there. What are you doing? Are you sacrificing yourself like the Word of God would have you to? Are you praying like the Word of God would have you to so the manifest glory of God would show up and show out in your life? The Word of God says that's what it takes. It takes sacrifice and prayer. So we pray and we sacrifice all we have and God shows up and shows out in our lives when He desires to. Not when we want it, but when he wants it. They didn't even know if he'd show up or not. Didn't care. Wasn't going to take a chance on it. I'm going to give him all I got just because of who he is. I'm going to give him all I have just because of what he's already done for me. Not because of what he might still do for me. This leads us to our final point. Write this down, if you would, please. As Christians, we must proclaim. We must pray. We must be prepared. And we must proclaim. Verse 3 reads like this. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, and the glory of the Lord showed upon the house. They bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. My goodness. When they saw the glory of the Lord in the place, they just fell to their knees. They fell to their knees in worship. They fell to their knees in praise. They fell to their knees in prayer. Because God had made himself real. His Shekinah glory had presented itself. Dear ones, the glory of the Lord should be so evident in our lives that people can't help but notice God has been there. The congregation of Israel realized that God had just entered the building. They were so moved by the manifest presence of God in the temple, it said they immediately fell to the pavement on their faces and started to pray and worship God. You are the temple of the living God. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. People should know when they meet you that God lives here. When you walk by someone, they should know God lives there. These people had no doubts 
no doubts, there was the burning fire of God all over that temple. You are the temple of the living God. Are you on fire this morning? Is his glory glowing around you? Do people notice you and say, God must live here? That's what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that they saw the temple, and it was so glorious and radiant that they had to fall down. They had to, just to worship. We are the temple. We are the temple of the living God. Do people see God all over you? We are the temple of the living God. Our very continents, our very appearance, and our very actions should proclaim to the world that Jesus Christ lives here. Amen? Give him praise this morning. Our continents, our appearance, our very actions should show the world I am the temple of the living God and Jesus Christ resides here. People ought to see it all over our faces, all over our walk, all over our talk. When they come in contact with us, they need to know that God lives here. Amen? Amen. Eyes closed and heads bowed, please. As the guy.